there, it's Kyle here and welcome to Mr. Marvel and Friends episode two. And we have two special guests here today with a couple of interesting topics. And first of all, I just want to say thank you for watching my first episode. It went pretty well with Locust and yeah, excited to do some more. So without further ado, let's introduce you to my first guest. And this is his first appearance, Declan from Let's Talk AC. Do you want to just tell, tell a little bit about yourself? Uh, <laughs> first time on cameras, so I am nervous, but I'm the host of Let's Talk Assassin's Creed. I'm just a rambling guy who's been a fan of the series for 14 years and would just talk anything about Assassin's Creed to anyone. And I'm glad to be here just to talk more Assassin's Creed. It's kind of a hobby now. Good stuff. Good stuff. And we have the return of the Locust. How you doing, hey. Locust? <laughs> How's it going, everyone? Good to be back. <laughs> and of course i'll put the links in the description for their sort of channels and pages so first topic i thought we'd get into we're just going to touch on this a little bit it's sort of the impact of covid on gaming now covid's impacted so many different sort of sectors and industries but gaming's to quite a, it's kind of benefited but it kind of hasn't so um i just want to Go to you first, Declan. What's your sort of first thoughts on COVID and gaming moving forward? Um, I think moving forward, it's a tricky one because trying to keep everyone safe through social distancing and staying at home, you realise your home doesn't have the same infrastructure an office does. So developing uh, speedy responses to bugs and crashes is so delayed, it's going to be very difficult. But recently, some companies like Hi-Res, who does Paladins, has realized that working from home is beneficial to mental health. So they are actually giving that as an option to work from home or work in an office. So maybe going forward, it can help people who are not comfortable working big offices from doing work at home. But how it affects bugs and crashes is something we should see further on. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, and you work in software, don't you, Locus? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you've got quite a big insight into this. What's your sort of thoughts? Yeah, I mean, the pandemic really uh, uh, hit the, the sector hard. I mean, I mean, the, the our sector, like in software, is prepared. I think it's way more prepared for uh, working from home environments uh, than any other. And my, my company, at least, already had like sort of like I could work from home a few days if I wanted to. Um, but that's the thing. Uh, I think in, in the video game sector, like it's way different because you you've got dev kits to use, and I'm I'm assuming that the company doesn't have unlimited dev kits to just give out to everyone. Uh, you have very powerful machines that probably the the you know, it's not the person that owns them; it's the company that owns the machines, and there's all all logistics uh, in that. And the, just a video game is very complicated. It's not, you know, it's it's very complicated software to, to sort of interact with. So, and I mean, it, it really depends on who is working. I mean, I work really, really well with people that are next to me. So like, if I want feedback, I say, hey, what do you think about this? And I get feedback immediately. And I can just sort of work from that. And if it's working from home, I send him a message. I have to wait maybe one hour, maybe he's off or maybe uh, he's doing something uh, busy, he's not looking at the, the messaging <laughs> program. So it's like you have that delay and that in games, which is a very collaborative sort of endeavor, uh, you know, it, it, it delays things a bit. So I think we're seeing that... Uh, and I think we're seeing that unfold now with video games. Almost every video game is being delayed. But, you know, I mean, I think it's just for the best. Otherwise, the video games would just come out all buggy messes and almost unplayable. But I think it's needed, basically. Yeah, I think the delays are the main thing. But at the end of the day, we get delays all the time anyway with games. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I've got a theory which is probably going to be wrong. I think developers are going to concentrate on smaller games from now. They're still going to be innovative and sort of ambitious, but I still I think they're going to be because of pandemic. They're going to concentrate on smaller games. 
a lot more focused, which is my hope for Assassin's Creed, which they're going to be a bit smaller, by the way. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I might just be I mean, no, guessing. That may be true. I mean, it depends because, you know, like just in recent years, it, it really depends on what the company that's making the game sees in the, in the sales numbers because, yeah. like, look at The Last of Us 2 and God of War where, you know, they are still big games, but they are very contained uh, environments and they sold tremendously well, but also Ghost of Tsushima also sold tremendously well, but it's, it's, it's a, a bigger experience. Um, but maybe if Ghost of Tsushima was being made like at this part of the pandemic, let's say it, it, it kind of hit, the pandemic hit Ghost of Tsushima rather late. So they probably were already like just finishing up everything. And, but imagine if it, it, it impacted like right at the middle of development, it probably would have affected their plans a lot because oh, an open world like that has so many moving parts, so many things that can happen that, you know, I, 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 think, you, I think it might be a side effect where companies might actually focus on, you know, more focused experiences and, you know, less... Less, less space for everything to just go a haywire. Yeah. I agree. You got anything to add on that, Declan? Um, I kind of think the opposite because I just kind of feel that we have a lot of investors putting time money into a game. When the game gets delayed, that's more money for the investors wait, uh, wasted in waiting and pushing out delays. So I feel like they want to try and make games a bit more expensive, just like what Sony's done with the PlayStation 5 games. But to make them more expensive, you've got to give gamers more reason to play them. So if you give them bigger, more bloated open worlds, then you can sneakily charge them a bit extra because you get more for your money. Whereas if you say, here's a big £70 game, but the world is as small as God of War, you may be thinking, well, there's not much to do. Is it really worth that £70? But if they say, well, this game will last you 200 hours for £70, you're going to think, well, that's kind of worth it. I get 200 hours for 70 quid. I'll happily pay that. Yeah, you might you might be right there. Uh, it, it will certainly be interesting because the knock-on effect is going to be seen for years, I think. For example, like, I think they should have delayed the consoles as well, the PS5 and the Xbox One, because they, they're not enough, there was there wasn't enough games. There hasn't been enough games. Um, yeah. and there's not some of the features are missing as well for those consoles. So plus no one can, I can't even get one. So yeah, maybe I'm a bit better, but but I think uh, they had to release the consoles just because of money reasons. Yeah. They have to hit the goals by the end of the year, of this amount of money, and it's all about the, it's all about the money. <laughs> so yeah, true. true. And it, um, but that's the thing. Like, I, I think, I think uh, Declan uh, touched on a, a really good aspect, which is like what, what people are expecting of video games. And it's like, some people, some people enjoy like they need the the t- the two hundred hours to feel like they've been they've had their money's worth uh, for the game, uh, and I, I mean I've been I've I I, I was like that when uh, when I was like when I was younger, and I had more time to play because all I did was like play, <laughs> so I was like in in, in school got home played and talked with friends and then university play as well like yeah. all I did and but now it's uh, it's a little bit different I think I I, I think I just they like, just God of War I've played God of War because the the story and the gameplay are just like fantastic and I've played I've played it three times already um and I think even just the first time I was like this is this is amazing this is the game of the year like mm. I've got my money's worth. Like just that experience was unique enough that I just felt like the money was already worth, but you know, there's always like these two people, you know, they have like two different, you know, takes on the video games and, you know, the investors are the ones that decide who are they gonna, you know, like who are they gonna uh, listen to? And they are just going to listen to the ones that for them, they, they think they they're going to make more money. Because yeah. at the end of the day, it's just money. <laughs> yeah, 
True. Yeah, I'll see both your points. See both your points. So, yeah, I'm glad we sort of touched on that. Um, but it is time for the main topic, which I think most people will be waiting for. I think you both are looking forward to, because I know you're both fans of Unity. So the sort of a question is, is Assassin's Creed Unity underappreciated? I'll go for you, Locus, first. Uh, I mean, it's weird. I, I want to say yes, but like I see, I see a lot of people uh, say that they love Unity, but I also see a lot of people say that they hate Unity. <laughs> but I mean, that's why I want to say that it's that it is underappreciated. But um, what do you think, Declan? Like, what what is your side of what? What do you see? <laughs> This is where we're probably going to get an angry army of pitchforks after me. <laughs> I, I, I dread to open my mouth, but I will openly admit I do love Unity, and I think it's a fantastic game, but I don't think it's underappreciated. I think when it was launched, we'd already had near enough seven games that just felt the same as Unity. The parkour was innovative, and it was fun, but with all the bugs, and there's even still some groundbreaking bugs in it to this day, I've played it and I got stuck on a table where to literally shut down the game and turn on. There's Typical. features, there's, a, there's even a feature in the game that's missing. You can't exit to main menu to save. You have to close the game. To me, I just don't think it's underappreciated. I just think that game is just, it's a good game. I would recommend it, but I just feel it's more deserves the hype it gets you'll always get the fans that think it's great and the fans that don't if that makes sense yeah i see what you're saying but i think as time goes on more people are starting to appreciate it because of what's sort of come after i mean the parkour and the stealth are the main two things yeah possibly the best in the series i think i think i, I what i have to say about this is that i think what is un- the video game itself is not underappreciated and I agree because it's like really buggy, are no controls like a, a, a tank on drugs. Um, and the, the parkour is amazing, but it's still like, it's still like just the, the game still needs a lot of work on it. And it, it shows that it needs work. Um, you can tell there's a lot of unfinished stuff there. And, but I think what is underappreciated is the idea of Unity, like that idea of an Assassin's Creed with so many like so many people in the streets like the social stealth uh the the, the using uh, tools in stealth the parkour fluid with animations and i think the idea mm. that's what people fall in love with i think it's like that idea uh, and also the co-op as well like playing with your friends doing all of that coordinated parkour and then killing the guards like fully coordinated as a team. I think that's the idea that people fall in love with in Unity. And that's what I fell in love with Unity as well. I think that's the idea. And uh, maybe if Ubisoft uh, had expanded on that idea, I think the, we would have quite a unique Assassin's Creed uh, right now. Um, but yeah, I think like the video game itself, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a little bit buggy. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I think that's the idea. The idea, the, the, the romanticized idea of Unity, I think is very, very much underappreciated. Yeah. Uh, go on, go on, Declan. I was just saying, I kind of feel like the problem with like the um, idea being underappreciated is because in Assassin's Creed now, there is two set of fans. There's one that really love the park on the staff and there's ones that just love the history and the gameplay. But when you look at like Twitter and you see people pull off some insane parkour, you kind of get this vibe in your head that it's so easy to pull off. But you play the game itself and you realise the parkour isn't actually as fluid as people make out. It's that fluid because of the practice. So I kind of feel like it's more overhyped than appreci- underappreciated, if that makes sense. Yeah. But like, obviously... We had Syndicate the following game, which was just a Batman rope launcher, which was not <laughs> like, not needed, really, was it, going to Victorian London. And then since we've had sort of three massive open world RPGs. So this unit is the last game where there's proper parkour. And it is, I think it is the best parkour in the series. And we it, miss that. It, it, it kind of, because that's the thing, like, 
What people love about the free Unity parkour is uh, the 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 responsiveness of the control. So, for example, you can start climbing a wall, and then you eject at, at whichever point you want. So basically, just you just have to press the button, and you have that agency. So you know, like if you practice and you start, okay, I am gonna do this wall, jump back, grab the ledge, jump to the side go up to the roof and then continue. And like, that's all mm. user input. So the user, if it if the user practices and starts getting to know the system, they, they can make really cool stuff. And in Unity, they, you don't have that. You have the, the fancy animations. And what people do with Unity is that, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, weird uh, shenanigans that you can do with the controls to sort of like force some moves out of Arno. Um, but I mean, then again, I think, you know, that's, that's, that's the idea. Like people saw the potential that the game had mm. and that's what they wanted. Like, oh my God, if this had one more year in the oven, this would have been amazing. Uh, if, if, if they continue to expand on the system, maybe it would have you know, blown everyone away. Um, but I mean, I, I totally understand, like. I think it's still underappreciated because a lot of people, they just see the bugs at the surface and they don't even, you know, they don't even care about the rest. So that's why, and I mean, ever since Unity has come out, I've seen a lot of people just like, uh, you know, just talk about how, talk about the problems. And that's why I say it's underappreciated because a lot of people just see the problems at the surface and they don't care about the rest. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I can understand that point of view. Um, yeah, I think because there's so many flaws or cons as well, though, that like everyone having a British accent, obviously we're both, me and Declan from the UK, we want to go to France and see a French accent. We don't want a guard chasing you going, oh, smash you like an old potato, like that sort of stuff. Like it's, it's not what I want yeah. when I go to Paris. I know, I know a lot of films do it, a lot of ancient yeah. films like back in the Roman days or there's like, people with English accents, but it's yeah. not, that was a, a big off-putting thing for me with uni. People may not, may not, you might not, but. Yeah, know, it, it was definitely weird because yeah. in, the, in, the, in the other games, you sort of had that differentiation uh, between accents. There's even a podcast where uh, Roger Craig Smith was the voice actor for Ezio. He said that he had like a, a actual a trainer to help him out with his accent uh, when he was speaking so like he's american i think maybe canadian so i don't know but i think he's american and he would speak you know he has to speak with an italian accent so how do you you know yeah. you go to the stereotypical kind of italian accent so he actually had someone actually say oh an italian person wouldn't actually say it like that they would actually coach him through the words and and by the end, you know, by the revelations, he just, you know, he has the character in the bag. He knows how to to change his voice and do it like that. So I, I, I when 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 I saw Unity, I was like, wait, so why why didn't they do the same thing? Like just have someone who knows French and just kind of coaches them a little bit. Because some of the actors uh, are like are uh, they speak Quebecois French, which is like French, but from Quebec, Canada, which is a, a little bit different, but still like they already know the French. So <laughs> they just have to, to do a few changes. Like, I don't understand why they didn't do it, but maybe time yeah. concerns. I don't. Yeah, it could be. Could be. Um, so let's sort of move on to the story because one thing, obviously, a lot of people didn't like as well was the sort of the modern day and Bishop, you know, a lot of people didn't like that sort of set up. Um, I think that's a write off the modern day, to be honest. But what about the actual Arno story and the sort of the Templar assassin feud, but they was trying to sort of call parlay or truce, whatever. What did you make of it, Declan? You go first. Um, what was about the story? What did you make of the story? Um, this is where more pitch fox come after me. I'm sure just be in hiding. I shouldn't be on these shows. Go for it. <laughs> I was kind of bored of the story. 
Like, I played Black Flag and I was like, oh my God, this is such a departure from the typical Assassin vs. Temple story. It's fun. And then just to play Unity, which just felt like another Assassin vs. Templar story, like in my head, Arno's character development wasn't enough of it. He just didn't seem to grow as much. And when there was all these big reveals, I kind of felt like, meh, I saw that comment was going to happen. And by the end of the game, I was like, well, figured that was going to happen. You know, Assassins were going to win. That was going to happen. It's an Assassin's Creed game. And I just felt like they could have done something more innovative and something more tied to the French Revolution. It's felt the stories did feel a bit distant from the actual historical events in my eyes. So you like you like the game, but the story is underwhelming. Because that's yeah, I thought the story is a bit underwhelming when I finished it. I thought Shemaine Shemaine was quite a good villain, quite a good villain. Um, and yeah, it was interesting with Elise being a Templar and that, but I, yeah, it just didn't resonate with me as like the previous games, like say Black Flag. I thought I love Black Flag. Most people know that, and then you got sort of a cop. Assassin's Creed 3 was kind of well-received, but all the, all the Etso games are beloved. Black Flag's pretty much beloved. Then you've got Unity, which just is a bit underwhelming for me. What would you reckon, Locus? Yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of story, like at the time when I played it for the first time, I enjoyed it. But it's kind of like I, I can recognize that the story... You know, it, it, you can tell there's, there's stuff missing from the story. <laughs> I mean, they didn't have the time to do the entire story. You can tell, like, there's stuff, like, I, it's so weird that Elise just kind of pop, pops up out of nowhere, and then you have a little bit of interaction with Elise, and you when you're, when you're expecting more, it's when the game goes into the final act, and and you sort of like end, end that way kind of abruptly a little bit. And you get like no real resolution until Dead Kings. Like Dead Kings was actually pretty intriguing. But then again, leads nowhere. So that's frustrating. Like Dead Kings was like awesome. And it was really interesting to see like uh, uh, Napoleon and uh, his, uh, his obsession. And um, I thought it was going to lead somewhere, but, you know, it... Um, it, that that frustrated me a little bit as well like the no follow up on the, on the on everything and you're right like after black flag i think people also have had different expectations because black flag was just pure brilliance um and you know like i think it under delivered the story for sure um but you know it, it's i think i think it's it, you know, like the it's the same thing as the game, right? The game is also unfinished, so the idea of the story is there, and maybe in an alternate universe, there's a complete version of the story that's just absolutely amazing. <laughs> maybe, yeah, that was the impression I got. They just rushed it out for a next gen, next gen game, didn't they? That was yeah, yeah, I mean, another year I, could have done it. Yeah, and they, I mean, there's one thing that I kind of remember at the time. People were always talking about like the, it was like uh, cloud computing stuff in gaming. I remember at that time at E3 that year, I remember some companies were talking about cloud computing, cloud computing this, and like a lot of companies, even Ubisoft, I think, kind of mm -hmm. talked about it. And it, and I think that's like one thing that kind of disappeared. It was like, oh, cloud computing is going to be like the best thing ever. And then they, they tried that in Unity and it did not work. And I think other games had it uh, that also had buggy. Because one of the things that I had to do, I remember on the PS4, I got the game. I got the game one day early <laughs> and I got it. And I was like, whoa, the frame rate is crap. <laughs> it's like, like the frame rate was just like, like it, it was like almost impossible to play. Uh, and one of the things that I found people were reporting and which makes sense with cloud computing is you just, if you turned off your, your Wi-Fi connection on the, on the PlayStation 4, in my case, the game would run better. And I mean, I, that was just another thing that was like, okay, so they, they were trying something like some shenanigan 
uh, trying to maybe improve performance using cloud computing. But, you know, at the time, like if, if you can't really do it nowadays with our connection, you know, back in the days, like, okay, there's not enough connection for that scene. You know, I don't think the consoles at the time could even do that. So I think that's another aspect. They were trying to go up, you know, go ahead in the tech game before it, before it was time, really. So I think that had an impact, definitely. Yeah, almost a bit too ambitious at yeah. the time, I reckon. Definitely. So what do you reckon, Declan? I know you sort of asked it straight away, but is it, you haven't really mentioned the parkour. Did you mention the parkour? I mentioned a little. I just, yeah. I'm I'm kind of one of these people that I do like Assassin's Creed parkour, but I find Unity's parkour just too much. Like my muscle memory from playing it is the simple puppeteer of high and low profile. And when you run at a building, it's just a simple two button prompt to run up and you do your free running shenanigans. And then this game, you suddenly got to remember once you're at the top, you're either going to jump off or you're going to have to remember you got to do low profile to parkour down. And then just that muscle memory of retraining to remember if you're running away from guards, you've got to park or up, then you've got to park or down, you're going to keep doing it. And if you and if you get to a wall, you have to press, I mean, play a wall, so you have to press LT to get through the window. And Anna would sometimes get stuck. And it just felt, what's the point? The parkour is just, you've improved it, but you've broken it as well, because there's times where I turned it off because he wouldn't go up a freaking wall. <laughs> I felt Ezio was actually clever at going up a wall in Revelations than Arna was on a PS4. And that's a huge generational gap. Yeah. But, I mean, I've just played it, just to make sure. <laughs> I like to play a little bit. I like to play Unity a little bit before this podcast. And it does, it, for me, it seems so much more fluid and, and a lot more fun than any other game, I think. That's my personal um, opinion. Yeah, I think, I think like, the like the biggest comparison that I can draw between completely different games and completely different like uh, environments and and topics is like Unity is very animation based, but it doesn't allow you to cancel an animation. So, for example, if you do uh, a move to to parkour down and Arno does that little flip thing. Yeah, like you can't, or you start climbing up a wall. You can't start climbing and then say, "And now I want to jump." You can't because you have to wait until the animation finishes, and then you can do that. And I think like the the like video games like have really cool ways of handling that. The Last of Us one, The Last of Us has really cool animation canceling uh, ways of doing the combat. Like if you if you in, watch like behind the scenes and how they do it. It's like really cool stuff. And Ghost of Tsushima as well. Like the combat in Ghost of Tsushima is very animation based. They have like realistic uh, movements and you can actually see the, the, the sword sort of like hitting and the enemies moving kind of like realistically. Uh, and you also have that agency. You don't have to wait fully for the animation to finish so you can continue playing or using tools or whatever you they they have all, almost like this fluid system of combining animations and also giving agency to the player because you have if you want to have like pretty animations and you have fluid uh gameplay it's like a really big challenge and i think that unity just didn't have enough time for them to actually put that polish into the game because yeah, parkour is definitely needs that polish because our no controls like a tank. <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's like a tank that goes up walls and jumps. He jumps so far, doesn't he? Yes. <laughs> Jump from one side of the street to the other. Just one leap. But yeah, I think that's the main thing about Unity it is the parkour that stands out. That's why I think personally it's a bit underappreciated now, even though I would say it's sort of below it's it's the bottom tier of ac games in my opinion but yeah um i'm gonna put you two on a spot here actually what would you rate it out of 10 i would say seven 
Um, if I can, if I remember correctly, I did do a deep dive review of Unity, and I think I rated it either a six or a seven. Oh yeah. I can't remember, but I remember it was last year I did the review, but I think it was about six or seven I rated it because it does have potential. I just don't think it's the best and not really a, a game that we should, that I feel I should hype to other people that you have to play it. I just feel like there's other games you could play and enjoy as much. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. That is fair. You like us? Go on. Be honest. I mean, for Unity, for me, I think, if if I want to put it on on my personal uh, personal uh, sort of like ranking, and uh, the I I have to rank the idea, so I would I would give it a ten out of ten, just go. because of the idea of Assassin's Creed. I think that Unity was the like like I said I think even on the last podcast, right? I said Unity was that first time that you look at an Assassin's Creed game and you see like, okay, this is next gen Assassin's Creed. This is what a Assassin's Creed could be. But of course, like that's the idea of Unity. Um, the idea that they had there was like, oh my God, this is such a great idea for Assassin's Creed, uh, but they didn't get it. So 10 out of 10 for the idea of Assassin's Creed there. But as a game, I mean, I would give it like a seven if it's working right <laughs> and uh, maybe lower if if the person is having a lot of bugs <laughs> but i think yeah. like nowadays if you play it on the pc with a nice pc i mean nowadays the, the game is a little bit old now so i guess you can run it fine with no ma- no, no major issues so but at the time it, oof, at the time it was rough it was really rough <laughs> Fair dose, fair dose. So I think, like again, I'm, I feel like I'm going to say this every podcast. We could go on, we could talk about this topic for hours, but I thought we'd touch on something else. We're going to, one more topic, but then we can talk a bit about other AC related stuff if you want, if we've got enough time. So um, it's been a lot of AC sort of related transmedia coming out, being announced recently. And I was shocked. I got a notification saying, Ubisoft unveils Assassin's Creed Black Flag and add a few dots. I got well excited. I got proper excited. I thought it'd be like Assassin's Creed 2. But then it's like some tune thing. Some, I, don't know, I don't know what it is. But um, so yeah, so I was a bit glad about that. But um, what do you guys think, Declan, you first about the transmedia, all of that, all of the news that's going on at the minute? Um, I'm a massive book nerd. I'll happily read anything in front of me. So I am super excited for the transmedia but if i have to be truthful i am not happy with it because oh. the current transmedia now is 33 comics and 14 books and this is a lot for people who are invested into the games and the law to get into and if they don't have the money they're missing out on law if it's not translated into their language they're missing out if they do what they did with juno where a major plot line was just lost to transmedia, that's going to ruin the flow of the games. And certain ideas that are introduced into novels are then touched upon in games, but then made out like the game started at first. And I call this back to Valhalla with Odin Sight. A lot of my friends who've played it say, Odin Sight's perfect for Valhalla. I'm glad they created it for Valhalla. And I have to say, actually, no, it was created in the Last Descendants third book. Fate of the Gods, where the 10th century Swedish assassins dubbed Eagle Vision as Odin Sight. So it's already got a place in the transmedia, but the games are not acknowledging it from the transmedia. They're just making it out as if it's a new feature just for the game, which with all the transmedia that's coming, that is going to keep hitting the games in the future and it'll cause some serious problems. Even though I love books, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will well buy them. Put. Yeah, you, all of them. Uh, I can't. I can't even afford them. I had to buy all the Last Descendant ones half price. Oh yeah, they're about ten pounds. Yeah, there Imagine is a lot. The um, ten. There's about a ten series novel coming for the Imperial Dynasty, and I think they're probably about seven pound in English money. So. A 10 novel series that you have to finish, you have to get all 10 to know the ending. That's £70 for 10 books. 
That's a brand new Assassin's Creed game. Mm-hmm. That's kind of horrible in my opinion. I don't want to be paying 70 quid for books when I could just buy a game and play the same story. But I may be going on a bit of a rant about it. No, I can understand that. What do you make of that, Lucas? Well, I mean, I think I, I think it, I'm on the same boat as Declan, which is, I think it's great. And we have all of this Assassin's Creed content uh, that we can consume. The problem is consuming. <laughs> can, <laughs> like, for, for example, for me, I, I don't have any access to that easily. Um, I mean, I, I might be lucky if some, like, Portuguese publisher decides to pick it up, but it's always going to translate it to Portuguese. That's what they usually do with books and stuff like that, uh, if it's the books. So, like, for me, that's already, eh, I don't, I don't want to have it on, in Portuguese. I, when I read, I prefer reading in English as well. Um, and that's if I'm lucky here. <laughs> that's if I'm lucky. That Usually they don't, like, the comics, no publisher picks it up here. Uh, even some books, like, only the main ones, like, the, uh, the main ones from the game. Um, and yeah, like it's it, a lot of people, a lot of people will have to either resort to like some sort of like piracy to read these. But, you know, like a lot of collectors as well, like will actually le- like have to pay a bunch of money to just to get access to these, to these books uh, if they want, if they even want to collect it uh, in the first place. So, I mean, it, it's great that we have it, but it's just a lot of stuff that well, we, we won't be easily getting. Some people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I hear you both. Like, I, I swear back in the day, it was only those novels that were like, um, Oliver was it Oliver Bowden? Yeah. Yeah, I, I've read quite a few of them, enjoyed them, especially Forsaken one. But back then there was not, not much else. So you thought, I'll read the novel so I, I know all the lore. But now it's just escalated hasn't it there's so much there's comics yeah bloody diaries and whatnot i have yeah. some comics but i had to pay a bunch of money for them uh, and then i just decided yeah just too much money and now now there's a lot of like new series new series coming for comics i'm like oh it's not over <laughs> <laughs> it's just like there's just a point where it's like okay you kind of have to either hope one day they're going to come uh, for my country or, you know, or I get just a, I, I win the lottery or something. <laughs> maybe, <Yeah>. maybe that's the trick. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't know too much about the sort of the Netflix series and that. Or that is that coming next year? It's a Netflix series. There's also like, also like an anime series. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I don't know. There was a, a webtoon, a webtoon thing. Like, I think that's. I don't. I don't know if we can call it anime. If I'm oh. not really into that that sort of stuff. But uh, it was like the what's it called the the Black Flag, uh, the Edward Kenway falls Edward Kenway, and there 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 was this audio thing, kind of podcast thing, for Shao Jun. I didn't really understand yeah. what it was, but I guess we'll see what, what it is. Um, oh, I didn't realize the anime was that Black Flag webtoon thing. I didn't know that. <laughs> it's not an anime from what I noticed uh, about it. Webtoons is just basically like a online live action, no voicing comics. So it's just reading a comic online. There's no voice acting to it or anything. So. Oh. Because when you read the description on the new um, stories that they've released, the website, they know it's the voice actor for the Shao John podcast. But if you look at the webtoon, there's no notice of any voice actors. So from what I'm gathering, it's just going to be, because um, you can Google webtoons now, and I've done it, just really live, flashy style mangas that you just read online. So oh, okay, I'm not looking forward to it. I'm confused by it. I will admit <laughs> Like, how are you supposed to do Edward Kenway since Black Flag and Forsaken already touch on him? Like, how are you not going to cross over and cause mini retcons by accident? Yeah, I think that's the state um, 
series that's kind of got itself in with retcons and sort of contradictions at the minute, isn't it? That's the trouble with transmedia, really. And having 10 plus games. Yeah. <laughs> but then again, um, as he says in the, uh, the Eurovision article, and I'm going to cover it in a later date in a bit more detail, with the transmedia, they can cheat by um, creating the books and call them simulations. So they're not they're not canon, as in the happen, but the canon AC universe through the slight spoiler, but ending of Valhalla's world tree. So they can cheat and say, it's not a retcon, it's just a new simulation that's not canon to the games. It's just a simulation of what if, like what Marvel did with the what if universe. So maybe they can cheat that way if they want to. Yeah, that's true. Could open up a can of worms though, couldn't it? It, it can, but I will argue in a later date that the idea of the world tree simulation is actually the cleanest way to do a multiverse because you can argue this one true simulation, which is what we're living through the games, and everything else is just a branching simulation that doesn't really matter because it doesn't affect the main simulation, which is what we're seeing through the games. So it then gives people the freedom. Do we just follow the games for the one true simulation or do we follow the branching paths? And it might make Transmedia cleaner. Could do. Yeah, you could be right. Yeah. That's a good point, actually. Valhalla's ending. Wonder. I wonder what's going to go on with that. Because it doesn't seem like there's going to be... Because apparently you can play the DLC after playing the first two arcs. I don't know if you know that. You, you know that, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, so is there going to be any modern day in the Wrath of the Druids? Probably not. So mm. we'll have to wait. I mean, yeah, we don't know. I hope there is. Because uh, I really... I, it's weird that we... Can we talk about spoilers here? Yep, spoiler alert, everyone. Yeah, spoiler alert. If you <laughs> haven't seen the ending of Valhalla... <laughs> Click away now. <laughs> Run. So basically, like, you know, like at the end with Basim, like us controlling Basim, or I should say Loki, uh, at the end there in the Animus, I think it, that, that's the thing. I think that he would, he's looking for something. So instinctively, like what I think is that's the DLC, like, He's gonna look for something uh, in the memories, um, but I guess they even if it if it, even if the DLC can be played after the two first arcs, that that's just you know you can can they can say just Loki just getting yeah, hopping onto the animus can just look at everything and just go through the same thing that Layla did, just get it, all the information, and uh, that's it. But yeah. I mean, I I really hope we have something because my my gut feeling tells me that Loki is not here to stay. I think yeah. that by the end, by the end of the, all of the DLCs that they have planned, I think Loki is gonna <laughs> gonna get is gonna get the the cut. I think that's my gut feeling. <laughs> um, I kind of feel because it's very common for games to do it; they kind of follow a trend. So. Looking back at how they've handled the DLC since Origins, it's always two DLCs that you can access um, that have no connection to the modern day. They're just like epilogues. And looking at how it's the first two arcs, I kind of believe it's like if you're a new player, this is just what Eivor did between one arc and another arc. So maybe the event of the Rafa Druids doesn't happen after Eivor's saga, but during it. So then maybe it's just, like how when you look for the anomalies at the very end as Bastion, he makes the note of, oh, another one of my memories. Maybe it's like he mentions, like, let's see what Ava got up to before she went to this storyline. So there's nothing in the modern day because I think that'd be too complicated and probably take away from so much they could do for the next game. If they put it on the DLC, there's no big pivotal points they could weigh the next game on. But I could be wrong. Yeah, that's... That could well happen as well. Yeah, it'll certainly be interesting. I'm just glad I can play Wrath of the Druids after I lost my save. I was talking about this last week on the podcast. Like, yeah, let's not get into that. <laughs> let's not get into that. 
But yeah, I've, um, Valhalla. I'll just get your quick thoughts on Valhalla, actually, Declan, because you weren't in the last one. Um, you're a pretty big fan of it as a whole. Um, yeah, I'm kind of like on the hype train of like, this is such a great game. Like, it's weird because um, when you look at the whole community on Twitter, uh, long-term fans like Mace, who's been since Assassin's Creed 1, like November of 2007, I joined. I shouldn't be so hyped when you look at because it's an open-world RPG. But even though it is a flawed game with the bugs and some glitches, I still think it's the, it's similar to what we said about Unity. The idea behind it is perfect. There is a lot of open-ended worlds for assassinations. There's a lot of social stealth opportunities, even though they're bugged and they could be fixed. This is, in my sense, the first open world RPG since Origins that feels like an Assassin's Creed. And it just feels like something you would play after Syndicate. It just feels at home with Assassin's Creed, where Odyssey is great, but it does feel like a huge departure from what you would expect. Yeah. Yeah, we were saying last week it should have been like the Star Wars, like an Assassin's Creed story or something like that. Odyssey, Assassin's Creed story. That's what it should have been called, but here we are. I think, I think, I think people, like the community itself, like the, I think people are just getting. I, I think they're, they're not getting tired, but they're they're missing more and more the idea of an actual assassin. You know, like play, and it's not. It, it can't be even an assassin. Be just like whatever. Like even if. People just want to play like they fell in love. They fell in love for the assassins, right? So, and uh, the the whole thing with the robes, you know, like back in the day, it was like, oh, let's see the robes of the new assassins. Let's see, like, oh, I prefer Ezio's robes, and oh, I prefer Connor's robes. That was like the conversations <laughs> back in the day. And now, now I think people like they see Origins and they're like, okay, sure, it's a, it's a great game. Go Odyssey, and they're like, okay, it's like the second game kind of deviating a little bit, but okay, sure, we, we're going to take it. And then Valhalla is like, tries to bring it back just a little bit, but I feel like Valhalla just kind of like dangles the carrot in front of us, and we're kind of like, we want it, we want it. And I think, I think people are missing that, that old school uh, feeling uh, because. Um, that's why so many people wanted Eivor to become an assassin uh, or a hidden one by the end. And so many people got frustrated that it didn't happen. Uh, but I don't think it's people being angry. Of course, there are always going to be angry people. But, <laughs> but I don't think it's like people being angry. I think it's just people being like... They, they, they want to play an Assassin's Creed game that you know, puts them like at the center of, uh, of, you know, whatever, like it can be assassin, Templar, it can be Templar, assassin, whatever. I think it just, people just want to go and fulfill that, uh, that olden days assassin fantasy a little bit because they've had three games right now, which is kind of like a little bit of a warrior fantasy kind of thing, uh, within the, the Assassin's Creed universe. So I think, you know, I think you know, they, they could balance everything out. I think having a fourth game where you have like a warrior kind of thing, it's kind of, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to get tiring, you know, more and more uh, as time goes on. So yeah. let's see, let's see what they do. I totally agree. Like we were sort of saying last week, it's, we just want it to go back to its roots now. And I don't even mind what the time period is, as long as it's back to its roots. Um, I kind of feel and I do feel like I may be the odd one out saying this but I feel like the concept of Assassin's Creed is just an enigma in itself that having all this assassin stuff on the roots is great and I do miss it I hope the next one we have it but when you look through world history and you look through what the games attempt and um, Origins is a great example it kind of shows you that after a while, you're going to get to a point where you can't keep adding assassins because it wouldn't really make sense. Like when you walk around uh, Egypt in the Altair outfits for Bayek, it doesn't feel right. 
it doesn't it feels like he's standing out so having that assassin's roots in origins just wouldn't feel right same yeah, with yeah. avor and i think this is the whole problem that with time and history and how the game's set out with its roots you're gonna hit a wall where you can't continue doing the assassin fantasy because it just won't make sense and then you're left with the enigma do we try something new or do we abandon the project because it doesn't feel like an assassin's creed mm. and i think that's just going to be a constant problem and i think the series needs to evolve and i'm going to quote six keys because six keys actually come up with a brilliant idea where what if it translated to more of the theme where she said on a twitter thread that the theme for valhalla is freedom versus control Ava went to freedom mm. from her destiny, which is control. That's an assassin versus Templar theme, weaving through the story. So even if it's not directly an assassin or a Templar, if you have that woven freedom first control in the story and the themes are there, maybe that's one way they could add the roots back in, even if it's directly not an assassin, if that makes sense. Yeah, I totally see what you're saying but they could at least make it in the time period where there's assassins and Templars. Yeah, I think you know? that's, that's sort of like mixing. I get what you're like, saying. Like what we said like last time, it's like there's two distinct things that identify like what I, like for example, in this case, it's a game, but like even a, like even a movie, right? You can say it's an action movie and then you can change the sequel to be something else. But in a video game, I think what people want for like when when people say i want an assassin's creed game yeah i think the story like really doesn't matter so that's where the idea that you said about the star wars stories comes in where the story if the story doesn't really make sense for an assassin's creed game and they want to change the gameplay completely that's where they can okay we can do like sort of like a what's it called a side thing there's a name for it. I'm forgetting. Spin-off. Yeah, spin-off. Oh, yeah. yeah. They can do like a sort of a spin-off. And I think more people would be more enticed to play it because it's, uh, you know, it has the Assassin's Creed. It still has the Assassin's Creed name on it, but it's not an Assassin's Creed game because I think it's the same thing as a video game. Like a lot of people who are angry, for example, for God of War, uh, changing so much because god of war changed so much but if you go to the identity of the game itself everything is still there except the, the whole like uh let's say it's not beat em up but there's a there's also a genre for that hack uh, and slash hack and slash uh, yeah. sort of like feeling and doing combos and but the thing is that the combos are still there the brutality is still there uh, when I st- when I first started playing the game, I was like, okay, the combat feels pretty simple. I was like, okay, this doesn't feel like God of War. But then, if you actually try like to play around and start, the, the game doesn't tell you which combos to do. Um, it, it sort of like gives you a few hints, like, oh, you can try this, you can try that. Like if you start playing around with you with it yourself, you're gonna see, holy crap! Like this is God of War. Like I can do all of these crazy things. There's like. You still have the 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 the, the rage, the the classic uh, Spartan rage. Um, you 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 have everything there, but it's just a different angle. The camera is just in a different angle, but it it doesn't play one hundred percent the same. But the ideas, the core pillars of God of War, are still there, and I think that's why it. So many people were like angry at the start, like. Oh, this is crap. But then they actually play the game. They're like, okay, no, never mind. <laughs> Everything's fine. Especially when you get to a certain point in the game and you get something. I think that's when people really, oh my God, yes, this is God of War. I'm not going to yeah. say anything because maybe you have never played God of War, but you should because it's an amazing game. I think yeah. that's, that's sort of like the same, the, the same backlash. I can understand. Like, I love the new games. And I absolutely love the older games, but I can totally understand people being angry at the new games because it's still marketed as an Assassin's Creed game, but it's not at the same time, right? It's mm. it's not what you'd expect from an Assassin's Creed game. I think the the close like we can also look at something like, let's say like Kyle, give me a franchise you really love. Xenoblade. 
Okay, I don't know that one. Xenoblade Chronicles. So I, I don't know what that is. I just know the JRPG. name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The JRPG. Okay, yeah. so let's say let's say let's say you you, you have Xenoblade Chronicles. Uh, what's the current one? The latest one. Uh, latest one was two, but they done a de definitive edition of the first one. Okay, so imagine yeah. Xenoblade three gets announced, and now it's a first person shooter. Oh god! You know, like they okay, it's no longer a JRPG. You know, Call of Duty is the new talk of town. So, like, now it's a first-person shooter. Like, would you actually play that game? Like, if you love the, the the whole world of Xenoblade, you might. You might. Okay, let me try this. But you're you're not in Xenoblade. If if you love Xenoblade for the gameplay, and you get this new first-person shooter, you you you. I think your opinion is valid. If you just like, okay, this game is not a Xenoblade game anymore. Right, I think that's. Yeah. It, I think the same. The same logic applies to Assassin's Creed, where some people get frustrated because they really love the gameplay, but you know, I think people need to kind of like separate things um, and not get angry about these things because at the end of the day, it's like we go back to the beginning. It's all about money. Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> so. And uh, just um, you got a point. You got a point, Declan? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that, like, I do agree. I think this is going to be the problem for Assassin's Creed is how do they establish an identity? And as I was saying with Valhalla, I think Valhalla does hit the nail on the head a little bit, you know, with how they try to bring back guaranteed assassinations through an accessibility setting. You know, that does feel like an old school feature, you know, assassinating people one handy. That's old school. But I have discussed before about, like, Assassin's Creed stories and being spin offs. I kind of feel like that creates the same problem transmedia is causing where you've got spin-off after spin-off after spin-off. You don't know which one's following a cohesive story, which ties with which. And then I'm going to call back to Rogue because this is what I hate about Rogue. People class Rogue as a spin-off because it's not directly connected to Black Flag and Unity. How, how Rogue ends is how Unity starts. If you imagine they did a spin-off Temple of Story and you're like, I don't want to play it, but the start of the next game ties in with that spin-off, you're then being forced to go buy the spin-off to learn how the ending, the start of this new game makes sense. So I just kind of think spin-offs can cause more problems, but Assassin's yeah. Creed is just hitting itself as a whole kind of world because it started off great, but it had to evolve. And now that it's evolving it's struggling to find its feet because you can't go back once you've evolved. But I'm here yeah. for the long run. I'm never going to stop playing. I'll play <laughs> anything. Stick a label on it and I'll play it. Oh, yeah. I think that's a good sort of sort of quote to end on. I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think I'll wrap this up now. It's been a good little discussion, episode two. You know, covered a few topics and that. And, yeah, thanks for coming on, guys. Thanks for making your debut, Declan. How uh, was it? Uh, just scary. Finally. Oh, mate. Scary. We're not scary. Well, I don't I'm look scary. like a ghost, but... <laughs> need to I usually get my tan going. What's that? I'm just so used to talking to a microphone. Like This is my only company on a podcast. It's not... Yeah. You pull this is a microphone. Well, you've, you've done it now, haven't you? <laughs> done it now, yeah. Thanks for joining, and thanks for joining Locust again. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me. It's great to be back. Thank you. Of, of course, like I said earlier, I'll put all your links in the description below. And uh, yeah, we'll wrap this up. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, and like subscribe to Locust as well on a uh, Twitch, Twitch and YouTube. And make sure you follow Declan on Spotify at Let's Talk Assassin's Creed. So yeah, take care and see you for episode three. See ya. Bye, everyone. Thank you.